All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate having you um, join us on this webinar. <clears throat> so this is making data data inclusivity click. So my name is Joelle Clements. I'm a director in the systems and operations practice at BWS, and I'm joined by my colleague Shannon Cooper. And um, so let's dive in and get started. So our webinar today centers around, um, around the fact that many nonprofit organizations are searching for really innovative and demonstrable, demonstrable ways to lead and create positive change through the discipline of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that intersection of where data governance and constituent engagement meets really presents with a meaningful opportunity to examine the need for um, and the application of those critical measures that are essential to promote inclusivity um, in an organization's database. So please join us as we dive into this topic today, um, looking at the critical steps needed to address and promote data inclusivity for your organization. And I'm remembering I need to share my screen. We'll get started here. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Uh, there we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint now. And we'll get started here. So what do we mean when we say data inclusivity? So really within this framework that we'll discuss today, when building an inclusive, inclusive database, uh, data inclusivity means ensuring that all data is collected in an equitable way and is representative of all individuals, regardless of any demographic or geographic characteristics. Um, and that really it's centered on the ob objective of preventing any database bias or discrimination from disrupting equitable actions and initiatives. So now that we've defined um, data inclusivity a little bit more precisely and started to talk about that a little bit more, let's do a quick poll um, and get everybody's thoughts on, um, on that. So the question we're asking today, this first question is, how would you describe the current state of data inclusivity for your organization? So do you feel like it's cutting edge and innovative with demonstrable success, building progress and creating awareness, um, invested but unsure of what steps to take or lacking structure and investment but keenly aware? So please feel free to, to chime in and share um, what your thoughts are on that. We'd love to see it. It's interesting. I think it's slowed down. There it is. Okay, I was waiting for it to pop up. Okay, great. So um, most falling kind of right in the middle of that spectrum, um, that building progress and creating awareness. Um, and invested, but but looking for those next steps and that guidance. So that's great. With some of some folks feeling like um, that awareness is there, but but needing more structure. So that's great. Thank you um, for kind of letting us know where you're at with that. That's great to get your thoughts. Okay. So let's keep moving forward here. So. Why is data inclusivity so important? So when thinking about this, um, a, a commitment to data inclusivity goes hand in hand with any organization-wide initiatives aimed at diversity, equity, and inclusion. So without an equitable and without equitable and inclusive data to support those efforts, initiatives, and measure outcomes, an organization may find that best laid plans, best intentions just don't yield the desired results. So an organization that 
makes building an inclusive database a goal is one that really brings added focus to the vision, bolsters effectiveness for the mission, reinforces organizational values, strengthens support for constituencies, and invests in that continued growth. And this ultimately leads to really creating a foundation to build deeper and richer relationships with your constituencies. And also thinking about, you know, within those constituencies, donors um, obviously included in that and how this all can support fundraising success as well. So when in this way, you know, with these factors um, included there, when an organization's culture and staff are really committed to that diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're ready to engage with constituencies in new ways. So this really sets up um, sets up that pathway forward for those optimal results for both engagement and data inclusivity. All right. So thinking about um, a framework moving forward for um, how we structure this, how we think about data inclusivity um, and that general model, right? So the CLICK model that we're going to talk through today is um, a comprehensive framework for methodically approaching this goal of data inclusivity for your organization. It's a holistic way of thinking about it, um, of viewing data inclusivity and of, of achieving it really while ensuring that an organization's core values are an intrinsic part of the process. So in this way, um, the curation and development of your database can actually be achieved in ways that make things click. So these five areas, community, learning, intention, clarity, and knowledge um, are really the areas of focus necessary to empower data inclusivity and provide that holistic approach. Giving, and, giving consideration and focus to these areas helps set your organization on the right path to realizing a more inclusive database that is optimized to support those diversity initiatives. Uh, so we'll talk more in depth about this click model today and dive into more details about each. So I'm actually gonna turn it over to Shannon to talk about the first component. Thanks, Joelle. So as Joelle said, the first letter in our click data inclusivity model represents community. Any path towards inclusivity must start with an understanding of our community and the fact that it's different from every other community. The ways that we've relied on in the past, relying on assumptions based on names to determine gender and third-party resources for donor research and record of pins should no longer be used to define our community's identities. The only way we can truly honor and get to know the people in our communities is by asking them to tell us about themselves. So this invariably leads us to self-identification campaigns. But self-identification can be tricky. We need to be thoughtful about the kind of questions we ask people to provide and the information they provide. Is our organization a safe space for people to reveal personal information? Think also about the cadence of questions and be willing to spread them out over the life cycle of your relationship as trust is developed. We should also consider what advantage our supporters will get by revealing personal information. What are we going to give them if they share us the, with, with us personal information? Are we going to give them an opportunity to be in a group with like-minded people of similar backgrounds? Are we going to ensure that they have accessible access at an event? What's in it for them if they give us this information? Significantly, we also must be prepared to source the information we collect. If we get people to self-identify, but that data is then mixed with data from research and appends from third parties without a field to segment the source, we've lost the integrity of the self-identification campaign. 
So when we go down the road of self-identification, we must be meticulous when maintaining our source information and the dates on which we collected. Related to that, we must also accept that personal identities evolve over time and the information we gather may only be relevant on the date that we collect it. I might identify as straight today, but be in a relationship with a woman next month. So how are you gonna make it easy for me to change my personal information? Giving constituents access to their own profiles so they can make changes at any time is an important consideration. A final area I wanna highlight in this section is security. Personal information, especially controversial personal information, and I'm here in Oklahoma and there's a lot of that, should be available on a need to know basis. There may be no worse mistake for our organizations than to be entrusted with people's personal details and then break that trust by being careless with it or worse, selling it. It doesn't take a massive data breach to fracture relationships. As we've seen recently, data in the hands of just one wrong person can soil the reputation of the entire organization. Okay, so before I scare everyone away on this first point, the good news is of course that all of this is doable. Self-identification cam campaigns are becoming much more normalized and people are getting used to sharing their information. If people are connected to your organization, they want a relationship. So just remember that relationships grow over time and be patient and authentic. Map relationships so that you build and maintain community trust and people will replay you with the information you need to develop in the way you want. The next letter in the data inclusivity model is L for learning. Relationships, diversity, equity, and inclusion are all at their core about learning. Not only about our constituents and ourselves, but also about the many ways that we're different and how we can honor those differences while still nurturing those things that we have in common. Cultivate a culture of learning in your community. Provide that space for grace because such learning opportunities are messy, but they can also be fun. Find ways to celebrate with your constituents. Use opportunities to be vulnerable. Ask people for help in learning and forgiveness when you make mistakes. Such situations can always deepen relationships. A few years ago, I included um, a volunteer in a team dinner, and we went to this hot new restaurant called The Pig, and I planned it all. I was so focused on the venue's trendy appeal and my own love of pork that I completely neglected to remember that she's Jewish and doesn't eat pork at all. It was humiliating. And it required me asking for forgiveness and her kindness in giving it to me. And of course, she reminds me of that humiliation every time we now eat together. But to avoid such humiliations yourself, maximize your CRM to track such data that helps you to remember your constituents' needs, preferences, and cultural practices that are important to them. Recognizing that there will be some that don't want to shake your hand or look at you directly or participate in photos, those things can help to avoid assumptions that can be interpreted as insults. At the same time, be prepared that this information too may change over time or be limited to certain times of the year. So tracking sources and dates for this information is important as well. For instance, someone who may need wheelchair access to the theater one season may not need it the next season. So stay flexible and be willing to ask questions. Joelle? So the next um, 
The next step in making data inclusivity click, it relies on intention. So ensuring that intentionality is really at the forefront of your organization's data inclusivity objectives will help support optimal outcomes and enhance these efforts. So this element adds strength to the previous areas uh, by inextricably linking data inclusivity to your organization's goals and initiatives. Intention then drives the implementation of data governance efforts and then becomes a catalyst later on for that continuous improvement that we'll talk about. So while intentionality can be applied to, oops, sorry, to all these areas, getting ahead of myself there, um, it's, criti it's a critical initial factor that your organization's vision for its data governance program should intentionally include a commitment to data inclusivity and that that commitment is then incorporated into the guiding charter for, um, for the data governance program. So um, the development of any data governance framework, as I'm sure many of you are, are aware, includes the establishment of those guiding principles. So for data inclusivity to become a part of that framework, it really has to become um, an integral aspect of that, that guiding charter, that framework. And for organizations committed to developing a truly inclusive database, they, they have to then take data governance to new levels of awareness, focus, and depth. So it means asking those difficult questions um, and digging deep to produce results that support and reinforce an organization's efforts to cultivate a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment. Um, there are five core elements of data governance to consider when developing initiatives aimed at curating inclusivity for your organization's data. Um, and how your organization goes about implementing and applying these elements will really impact the effectiveness of such initiatives. So beginning with that, intentionality and incorporating that commitment um, to inclusivity into your organization's objectives is really critical. So those core areas that, that I wanna highlight um, to, to really focus that intentionality will be the, um, the ones listed here. So data the data assessment um, to begin with. So that's a critical first step. Um, is ensuring that data assessment efforts include a comprehensive data inventory with a focus on discovery and understanding of your organization's data inclusivity needs and existing data points. Um, and then a data governance committee. So that's a critical guiding body that will help um, guide and implement um, and facilitate the adoption of policies, procedures, um, data collection efforts, et cetera, throughout, um, throughout a data governance program and throughout enacting these data inclusivity objectives. And that um, le by leveraging that committee, you can really um, reinforce and ratify data inclusion, inclusion as an integral part of the program. Then thinking about data quality. So looking at um, focusing those committee efforts um, for data management, focused on um, supporting data inclusion while establishing standard definitions and business rules across the organization, really to help preserve um, the integrity of those critical data points. And then data architecture. So thinking about um, refining the existing data infrastructure to build cohesion and promote optimal data inclusion, accessibility and reliability. So thinking back to some of those points that Shannon mentioned, um, what information are you collecting? How are you storing it? How is it secured? How is it accessed, et cetera? And really ensuring that um, your architecture is set up in a way to support that. Um, and then data stewardship, which really um, means focusing attention from the outset on stewarding those data governance efforts, all those policies, procedures, uh, initiatives, et cetera, um, 
to ensure that they're implemented and adopted successfully. Jan? Thank you. So the next C is for clarity. Each piece of information you collect on someone's identity must have a clear purpose. It is important to take time when adding fields. As the uh, Joelle mentioned around the Data Governance Committee, promote clarity and definition regarding the data points among staff and constituents. For instance, there are reasons for organizations to want to know my sexuality, but when that's the case, I want to have a clear understanding of what they're asking for, why they are asking for it, who's going to have access to it, and what the benefit is going to be for me if I share it. Be prepared to provide that clarity from the start. Such clarity also forces us to recognize when data might not be essential. Some organizations may think they need to know my sexuality, but all they really need to know is how my household is organized and how I expect my gifts to be credited. Think through those issues. Work through these considerations before you start to collect the data. Think about creating a data dictionary, and I've listed some on this slide that we particularly like that outline the terms for the your organization uses, as well as a separate data privacy statement from your regular privacy statement that details the how, what, who, when, why, and where of the information you collect and the safety protocols that you have in place. Make this information very, very easy to find whenever you ask for data. The final step, we can go to the next slide, in the data inclusivity uh, click model focuses on knowledge. Think about the critical information your organization is entrusted with and how to fully leverage that information. Knowledge results when your team dedicates itself to that culture of learning. Data management must be seen as a cyclical process within the ongoing evaluation of your organization's culture and infrastructure. Continuously examine, evaluate, and analyze the data, processes, and programs that comprise your organization's efforts to promote data inclusivity. Consider establishing precise metrics and goals that are centered on driving outcomes, as well as identifying the metrics that offer insights into how your organization is progressing with its inclusivity goals. Challenge your organization to establish annual goals as you're moving forward. So for instance, how many of your constituents participate in your self-identification campaign? Have you increased the accessibility of your events? Do you have an events policy in place that ensures that? How diverse is your donor database? Have you increased it over the year? And what about your own team? Is it more diverse than the year before? And at the end of the day, since we're all in fundraising, you must ask, have your efforts increased your engagement with your donors and their investment in your organization? Structural change takes time. Those who recognize the need for diversity and inclusion also recognize the centuries of exclusion that create the need for such deliberate changes. None of us are going to miraculously change our organizations overnight. We are all gonna go slower than we'd like, but deliberate methodical change towards goals, however slow, can only make a positive difference. Okay, so now let's talk about evaluating readiness. Before you jump off of this call and say, okay, I'm ready to change our database. And believe me, I hope many of you will, and a lot of you will come to Joelle and I for help. But before doing that, 
I want to slow everyone down a bit. Changing your database should not be any organization's first step in the DEI journey. You will only be ready to truly implement an inclusive database once your organization's culture and infrastructure are ready to deliver against the promises you make in the data you collect. If your organization or fundraising office attempts to implement an inclusive database with donor self-identified data before your staff and infrastructure are ready to support that data, you're likely to create more damage than your good intentions. Angelique Grants and Ronald Schiller's DEI maturity model provides a good outline for measuring readiness in organizations and institutions. This model is specifically designed to assist organizations with evaluating how mature their organization is when it comes to having an inclusive culture and realizing the benefits of diversity and equity. The first level begins when an organization makes a commitment to addressing the problems, creating goals, and establishing policies to make changes. The second level is more active. It encompasses the programs and training that involve everyone in the change. And then it's at the third level, understanding, which is a strategic phase where database transformation work should begin. During this stage, DEI practices are well-defined and culturally embraced by your team. People are ready at this point to change their environment and their database. The fourth and final level, change behavior, represents the daily practice of inclusivity. This is the point where the information you collect gets used to engage people in truly exciting and in meaningful ways. Obviously, getting to even the third level is not an easy process. People and leadership come and go. And because of that, priorities change and sometimes move backwards, as we all saw during COVID. The process requires us to critically evaluate data governance, constituent engagement, and personal biases and assumptions in new and potentially difficult ways. What's more, given the ever-evolving nature of the discussions around DEI, there is never a point of true readiness. And there's unlikely a point that any of us will ever be able to deliver inclusivity at all times to all people. When your team is ready to make mistakes and wade into the messiness and wonders of new relationships that honor people where they are for who they are, then I encourage you to begin. And of course, BWF is always ready to partner with you on this great adventure. Joelle. Okay, great. So now that we have, um, we talked through the, the click framework and those key areas, um, we're curious to hear um, now, how are you feeling about approaching data inclusivity um, at your organization? So are you ready to um, brainstorm and develop awareness, connect and prepare, strategize and build, or take it to the next level. So please feel free to chime in and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear um, what you're thinking now. It was like it slowed down. Okay. Great. So it looks like um, a few in those. So brainstorm and develop awareness and um, 
ready to strategize and build with um, connect and prepare. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for um, for sharing kind of where you're uh, where you're at with it now and what you're thinking. So, okay. With that, um, let's hear from you. So, we'll um, we'll take some time for a Q and A, and um, we'd love to hear from you. Any questions, thoughts, comments? One of the questions we hear frequently, I'll go ahead while people are putting questions in the Q&A, is how do we develop and ensure that the, the team uh, leadership to fully understand and embrace uh, data inclusivity? And what we find is that the important first step is to find an ally in leadership. Oftentimes, um, HR is a good resource for finding uh, those leaders that can help. But any leader is fine and it doesn't have to be at the top leadership levels. Um, and have patience building from there. Um, we find that if you promote and demonstrate ways that you're making progress, people will begin to build on that momentum. We encourage you to find a consultant um, that specializes in these DEI conversations to partner with you on that journey. Okay, great. Oh. And to to go along with that, Shannon, to that point, um, I think leveraging the Data Governance Committee to um, to really um, promote and demonstrate that value is really helpful in in building that awareness. I think that's one of the questions we just got in the chat is, where do you recommend starting to create um, awareness? So what team? And I think that goes hand in hand with that, that promotion and that awareness um, to create that buy-in is, is really leveraging that data committee, data governance committee as that guiding body who can also be, um, be that resource to connect with leadership. Um, and, and create that buy-in across the organization. So including, including key stakeholders um, from, from across teams and units. And next one, what guidance would you offer to begin team or internal learning around data inclusivity? I think that um, team or internal learning, I think we have some resources in the white paper um, we wrote, which is available on bwf.com, but also uh, consultants, um, I think are really good external factors to lead you through it. And there are some just great um, package training um, available uh, in this area, as well as websites that focus on things like celebrations, um, and um, getting to understand different cultures and people. Um, and the resources that we provided in those uh, data inclusivity guides um, are good uh, websites that have that kind of information that can help. Other things, Joelle? No, I think that's good. So one of the questions is, I'd love to hear ideas about where to store the data in the database. Um, I, I wouldn't, and it sh should it be in notes or attributes? I, what do you think, Joelle? So I think, I think it depends on the type of data and what system you're in. Um, so kind of thinking back to those points about accessibility and security um, and how, um, how you want to collect and store that information depending on what the information is, right? So um, like sensitive information being um, being more privileged, et cetera. Um, so I, I also, yeah, go ahead. I would also say that um, I would minimize what is collected in notes. 
Um, again, you want to be able to um, evaluate how well you're progressing and notes won't provide you with any metrics, but they will provide context um, for information. So um, if somebody, uh, religion is a really uh, good example, also political affiliation. You know, uh, if you don't have a measurement on those fields to indicate how deeply they're involved in those groups, um, capturing that in notes is important so that you understand, are they, you know, uh, deeply affiliated with that group or is it something that uh, they just um, align with? And just to piggyback off that, you know, again, thinking about the the security and accessibility, like fields like gender, um, race, ethnicity, those are typically best, you know, their own fields. So you actually have a way to um, to report off that information to Shannon's point, you can't really, um, you can't really dig into notes in that way to report, report off of them and like, and measure those outcomes, so. Okay. So yeah, this, quite a few. Go ahead. yeah, this question about how do you best determine whether or not you need to know demographic information? Is there a way to establish a process to evaluate if the information would be helpful? I think these discussions, especially in the data governance committee around always going back to before you add a field, what's the purpose that you need behind the data and being able to articulate that? How are you going to use it? Um, you know, before you start collecting accessibility information, um, you know, do you have that event policy? Do you, are you committed to having webinars that have certain types of accessibility features? Those are the kinds of questions you need to make sure and ask, because once you start collecting it, you're, you're making a promise. The other thing I think is really important to think about is who's going to need to see that information and maintain that security um, so that it is it is not um, always available to everybody. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make, um, Joelle, before giving it over to you, is that you know there are a lot of different ways that we can define ourselves, and you don't want this huge drop-down list. You need to evaluate your own community and have enough um, insight into your community um, to minimize that drop-down list. That drop-down list should not have an other. You don't want to other people, but you do want to have an option that will give people a way to define themselves. And by tracking that, it can help you to determine what kind of options you want to have on that drop down list. Joelle? I think that's great. I think we're, I wouldn't add anything to that. We can move on to the next one. Okay. Okay. So do you have a sense of the type of personal demographic data that poses the greatest risk to an organization? I think the more sensitive the data, the more um, cautiously and, and carefully and intentionally you should approach um, collecting and storing it. So it's, if you, um, you know, as part of your data governance framework, ensure that data security and um, you know those best practices are applied. Thinking about presenting or presenting, thinking about preventing um, those kinds of instances where um, where an organization would be at risk from a data breach or um, other situations like that. Um, that's um, that's yeah. helpful in in ensuring that you have that um, framework developed. And this is where a compliance person in your legal department needs to be involved. You know, um, 
you don't want to add things that will be illegal um, to collect, especially um, health information. That that accessibility information can walk the line, um, privacy information. And so having someone that has knowledge of the strictest, because most of you all, even if you aren't operating internationally, you might have don't, if you're on the web, you've got to assume that you could have donors that are international. And so looking at the strictest compliance laws around donor privacy, um, is a best practice when collecting this information. And do we have any examples of what a self-identification um, campaign would look like? So any institutions that have done those well in recent years? Yeah, in our um, white paper, we um, provide a, a few examples of institutions that have done it. Most of those are um, institutions uh, that they're HR campaigns, but there are some Canadian universities that have done student campaigns. Um, there's also, if you begin to look at, especially when you're registering um, for events, uh, there are um, what I would consider to be self-identification um, questions on there. Um, you know, can we ask for uh, what pronouns you use? Peppering those into um, those kinds of invitations are really is a really helpful way to begin to gently build that data into your system. But again, I want to be careful about that because you you definitely don't want to make assumptions about um, information. So for instance, um, the information my son provided when he applied to college is not how he self-identifies on a regular basis. And so remember the context for where the information was gathered and when it was gathered. Um, to make sure that you're understanding um, what that information is about. Okay, um, so I'll summarize this question a little bit. So okay. um, that institution recognizes that we need to do a better job collecting and storing self-identified personal data but the, the current CRM cannot accommodate most diversity data. So not storing multiple um, ethnicities for constituents, um, upgrading the next, the, within the next three years, but there's work to be done. Um, bridging the gap between current and future CRM. That's a great question. Um, I think it's it's excellent to to be laying the the groundwork for that progress and thinking about um, thinking about how you're going to do that going forward and making sure you have the infrastructure in place to do that. I think I would echo a lot of what Shannon has said and just in terms of be a bit conservative at first um, because you don't um, you don't want to get into a position where you've kind of gone down. The wrong path. So, you know, with a CRM that maybe can't do what you need it to do. So you data it hasn't been maybe collected in the most um, efficient way yet because you don't have that capability. So if you um if you maybe think about planning for that data collection when you do have the infrastructure in place, because so kind of thinking back to those earliest points about um or those earlier points about evaluating readiness um, and kind of tackling it when, when you're kind of at that point, I think that that's a good, a good way to approach it. Anything you would add, Shannon? No, I think that it's, um, it is hard because most databases aren't built for this, which is why we really wanted to um, start talking about how you can incorporate DEI into your daily practices. Um, that's really an important concept for uh, 
Joel and I, but we, you know, we recognize we're going through it here. You know, it's, it's not an immediate process. It takes time, you know, and in the meantime, you, you, use the resources you have and do the best possible, but I would never rush the process um, because you don't want to set up expectations that you can't deliver against. And I would really take that time, um, you know, while you're, you're progressing towards a system conversion and implementation to lay the groundwork for data governance, if you haven't already, because it's really, it's a critical, um, component to have in place. And once you have that set up, implementing um, inclusivity measures later on um, becomes that much more um, feasible. Okay. So thoughts on key positions for an effective infrastructure to support yeah. this. Gisela, thanks, thanks for your question. I think that's a great question. Um, so thinking about, I would point out the data governance committee structure. So I think we've highlighted, um, Shannon, you mentioned like a data security compliance role, um, which is of course critical. Um, but thinking about a data governance committee structure, having those executive sponsors, um, project sponsors, steering committee chairs, people who um, maybe are subject matter experts, um, who form those core project teams with um, like advisory committee chairs and, and project directors kind of in, in the middle there. Um, but that, that kind of core group should, um, should really comprise key stakeholders from across the organization and, and subject matter experts. But I think. Um, I would also think, throw yeah. in, yeah, the HR person. <laughs> <laughs> that HR team, they've done this work. Legally, they've been doing it since at least the early 60s, right? And so they've built the structures. They've done this work. They're doing the campaigns. They're really at the forefront of what we're talking about. And so bringing your HR team in um, can really help you to uh, achieve some lessons learned uh, that they've gone through already. Great. Okay, I wonder if you suggest retroactively reviewing information or just creating procedure proactively for the future. So I think um, going back to that data assessment component, part of that is reviewing existing data. So I, I think that discovery and the identification of existing data points is an important um, aspect of that while you're, um, you're looking at laying the groundwork for, um, for the future. Yeah, and I, I wanna, I, I was, I led donor research at the American Red Cross. So I wanna be careful that I don't leave you with the impression that we wanna throw out donor research and even appends. It's just important to make sure that you're putting the information you're gathering into context again. You know, uh, and, and I would encourage getting rid of the, the old assumptions and that kind of thing around uh, salutations, trying to find um, more neutral ways until you collect the data from the donor themselves um, around Mr. Ms., uh, that kind of thing, even spouse, child, rather than husband, wife. There are neutral options that you can use um, so that you move away um, from assumptions and uh, third party sources uh, to address people. Okay. And this looks like it's one from the chat. So thinking about pronouns are emerging as an area of significant data enrichment, as well as significant awkwardness and potential gaps. Any best practice guidance there? 
So I, I, I would ask people, you know, live in, through invitations um, to, to share that information so that you can respectfully engage with them. Um, and I also think that it is important, again, to um, have a place to store that information so that once you've asked for it, you can use it um, and uh, transition some of the other uh, gender affiliated information you have um, there. Uh, the, and uh, one more thing, as I've talked about with the, the drop down lists, you need to make sure when you're building your um, database that you're allowing for the flexibility of changes. Okay. So uh, the pronouns is a good example because people are trying out new pro pronouns. And so they might give you pronouns that you've never heard of before. So thinking about how you can have the flexibility within your system to add, um, notate that kind of thing is going to be important in this area. And then um, in the higher ed setting in particular, so you have admissions, financial aid, um, advancement, development, all keeping records, asking constituents for data points, any tips on alignment across the university? So when a student or alum is added to our database, the checks, the check boxes or attributes align. Great question. I, I think this goes back a little bit to um, infrastructure. So thinking about um, how your data architecture and is set up. So data storage and how, um, whether that's warehousing, data marts, however that's, um, that kind of all fits together across the, the campus puzzle um, that you have, thinking about how that's set up in a way that supports that alignment. So working with IT, those, so those natural partners across campus, um, you know, for data governance, particularly IT um, development, um, technology areas as well. So um, thinking about how you set up that infrastructure to, to support that. So the last question um, that it looks like we're getting and feel free to add more is how to protect uh, your organization when an employee leaves who has had access to donor information. And of course, you wanna make sure that you have your confidentiality policies in place um, and you know, be sensitive as you transfer portfolios, um, as you bring in new people, make sure that if there are people um, that have a vulnerable information in your system, that you feel confident that the new person is going to be able um, to handle that information with respect and care. And if not, consider reassigning um, vulnerable populations to other um, uh, gift officers. Joelle, will you add to that? I think you touched on it, just having those confidentiality policies in place and ensuring, I think that HR and legal are a good um, are good resources within the organizations to ensure that this area is covered. So it looks like we're getting close to time. You want to put up our information? Yeah, I, we've got about three minutes left. So let's do that. All right. Thanks everybody for all those questions. That was that was fantastic. So we appreciate you chiming in. Um, so we'd love to get your feedback on today's webinar. Um, please feel free to scan the QR code here and complete a brief survey to share your thoughts. I'll leave that up for a second and give folks a chance. Or it looks course, like Lauren also put some stuff in the a link uh -huh, to uh, the evaluation in the chat. Excellent. So get the link in the chat. Um, I'll leave this up for just a second. And then of course the recording will be available. So you can go back and, and scan it later on if you need to and go back and review anything um, that you'd like to. And then the last slide has our contact information 
and QR codes as well to our LinkedIn profiles. We'd love for you to connect with us in either of those ways.